So we, we talk about physical health a lot, particularly with athletes, that everyone's got it. But everyone's also got mental health, right? All of us have. And that also goes from being really well, feeling good within ourselves, and also struggling as well. And we all move up and down that continuum, whether we've been diagnosed with something, not feeling too great, really struggling to cope with life, or really flying in life. And everyone's got all of it. And the stats sort of show that one in four people in general suffer from depression and anxiety. But some of the data that's come out of the sports psychology is that one in two men in elite male team sports also suffer from it. My experience of mental health is that I didn't even really consider it until I was in my 20s and, it started, and I started to struggle. You know, certainly for me, it, I've had long, long periods where it hasn't been okay. So just broad general open question, what's your experience of, how about the, your chaps as players? Mental health and um, physicality should be on the same page, you know, because everybody going through something yeah. and people don't really know. Right. You know, you might be injured, you might have family problems, you got some performance issues, and we got to be able to speak up because, I mean, I think we, we, most of people is really scared to be judged. Yeah, I mean, I understand, I can understand anxiety, especially if you're playing uh, teams that they expect like a really high performance from you and they're fighting for uh, titles. But eventually, when you get older, that transforms something else. Like, you, uh, you're unable to sleep, being jumpy or being more aggressive. So there's that point at which the anxiety stops being about the body being prepared to perform yeah. and becomes in something, yeah, something, something bigger else. and deeper, yeah. absolutely. Coach? I believe that you cannot uh, separate your physical college condition and your mental college condition. You know, I saw players being physically on their peaks and mentally not on their peaks, not performing well, but I saw the opposite also. Definitely uh, an issue that needs to be recognized and treated. But like Jason was saying, it's, uh, we, we cannot look at it as a, as a weakness. We need to look at it as a illness, like any other illness, any other injury. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, the, 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 first, the first big time player who spoke up about this issue was DeMar DeRozan. I was with the guy five years, almost every day, and really never had the, the feeling that there was something wrong. So obviously there are a range of factors that have an impact on someone's mental health. So we talked about transitions, whether you're moving to another club, to another country, whether you're going from junior to senior, or whether you're moving from being a player into retirement, whether that's your own choice or forced through injury. We talked about some of the on-court stuff that happens, pressure to perform, pressure to win, come back from injury, come back from illness. And then, you know, we also mentioned some of those life events, you know, having family, you know, all of those things have a factor on our mental health. Let's start with the transition piece. Going from junior to senior, as players, what was that like for you guys? I came from Uruguay when I was 15 to Spain. You know, I went there by myself. You know, it was like my dream come true. And that, like the first couple of months, I was like, okay, you know, but after the fifth, sixth month, I felt so lonely that I really want to go back. And sure. that spring was, that moment was really tough for me. Yeah. 
Do, do, do you have, can you relate to that, Saul? So? Yeah, yeah, of course. By 18, I got, a, I got a transfer from Greece to Italy. Being in a team, being the highest paid player over there. And they don't expect you to be like a kid. They expect you to actually get games. Yeah. They won't tell you like, okay, it's not, it's not so bad, you miss a shot. You're 17. The worst thing is if you got skills, if you can play, and you get uh, attention, so either they love you or they hate you. Right. So when they, when they love you, everything's okay, but when they hate you, I don't think at that age, anybody can handle that. Okay. Especially because you got a lot of emotions yeah. inside of you, you know? And with so young, you, really, you don't really know how to realize those emotions because yeah. you never learn. Nobody right. teaches you that, sure. you know? And as a coach, how do, you, how do you handle that? You always, as a coach or as a GM, you're always trying to have a healthy locker room. Yeah. In a healthy locker room, of course, people will help younger guys, especially if they are big time potential. Sure. Clubs used to have flagships, play, flagship players. Uh, Maccabi had their own flag people with Nikola Vujicic and everybody, and uh, Parachnaikos had Albertis, uh, Olympiakos had Papalukas. Those were the, psych the psychologists of the, of the team. Uh, this is how I grew up. This yeah. is how uh, I, I grew up in this kind of situation. I had a problem. They would take care. They would take me out under the wing, talk to me, tell me what's up, how you doing, how you feel, everything that we talk about. Yeah. Some teams, like he said before, got Papa Lucas. Just, you got people like that that can, you know, receive you in in a place. But some of the teams, you don't have those kind of guys. Also, from a manager's standpoint, uh, first of all family situation, yeah. because that's the first level of expectation mm -hmm. that they have to deal with, you know. And today, you know, it's not only parents' expectation, it's not only coaches' expectation. I mean, they have uh, potential agents, potential uh, handlers, potential guys uh, offering money, making opportunity. You know, the guy, the, the young man can be truly overwhelmed by a situation, and he needs to have right mentors. And this is sometimes where the problem is. Who are the people helping them? Yeah. It could be a healthy locker room. It could be someone in the organization. Hopefully, there should be a good family, a good friends. Otherwise, they can get lost. That probably leads us a little bit onto some of the on-court factors that affect our mental health and that have affected your mental health, players, coaches, managers. So, you know, those on-court factors of the pressure to win. Uh, being fired during the during the season, well, it's not a pleasant one. And uh, honestly, you know, the first one when it happened, it was a pretty hard experience, you know, tough. And uh, it took a little bit, some time for me to, you know, to handle that. Actually, what you're trying to do is like uh, preparing for yourself for the next for the next job. And uh, basketball is giving you a lot, also taking a lot. So you have to be ready to pay the price. Somebody is ready to pay you. Higher price, somebody's not. That's also some form of selection. As a coach, how much is mental resilience part of your approach to your team? All of the time we're talking about uh, physical recovery time, okay? Let's talk about a mental recovery time. I need guys, I'm trying to find guys who are resilient. <coughs> you know, their resilience as high as possible. I'm trying to find a guy who will be focused. So, Coach, you talked about that sort of pace of physical recovery time yeah. and the pace of mental recovery time. And, you know, Jason, I know you've had some injuries and you've had to do both of those things. Perhaps tell us a little bit about that. Well, this was a really tough moment, you know, because before the injury, I was dealing with, we pain like for almost two years. One day I was on the couch and we had practice around six, seven. And I was like, I don't want to play basketball no more. Well, everything started like in around November 2017. You know, I started having a lot of pain, you know, and that was affecting me a lot, especially mental. You know, I was, uh, I was having anger problems. You know, I was like complaining about everything. My mind was like, well, I got I to fight through. I got to keep going, keep pushing, because one day maybe I'm going to wake up and I'm going to feel great. But it wasn't like that. You know, I kept going, I kept going till the moment, first game of the, of the season, the first minute. I tore my kills. I was, um, I was devastated. But after 15 minutes, I was in the locker room realizing the good and the bad that this injury and made me realize having a new uh, baby in December. That really helped me to keep pushing and say, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be back as soon as possible, not only for me, 
you know, only for my wife and my kid. And I think it was working with professionals before that serious injury happened to me uh, helped me a lot. And I'm right now in a situation that I'm, I'm trying to recover as fast as possible, working hard every single day, and keep working also with the therapist and with the trainers. You know, you're just struggling, but you, you don't know why. Right. You know, like you have a bad game, a bad practice, but you don't know why. You, you might think, well, I need to practice more, but right. maybe you keep practicing more, but you keep performing the same way. Yeah. The results are not coming. Sure. You don't know? be soft. Don't right. be soft. Exactly. Keep going. Keep pushing, you know? And that's when you got to figure it out or like trying to know something is going on because right. everybody's going through something. I'm going to be a better version of myself now. Yeah. You just got to look for help and talk. Right. You know? Our culture uh, does not yet allow us to admit what we need and we need support. We need support in every in a lot of situations, <clears throat> in sports and in life, but it's, we're talking about basketball, so um, we, we need support. And um, I think what is changing is the communication. Right. The communication between teammates, uh, players and coaches, players and managers. Um, one of the key things in order to grow and, and help each other is sharing better communication, uh, you know, uh, how this relationship evolves is fundamental for the success of the team and for the growth of a player. Right. And, uh, and I always say the secret of a winning team is a team that is capable of smiling, yeah. you know, but that smile comes from the right the right sharing. Yes, you guys, are, you all work in professional basketball and I work in sports. But I also have life, and you guys have life. So life events happen. And what happens when basketball and, and life events collide? My experience, after I tore my Achilles, I was in the locker room like for 15 minutes. I was so frustrated, I was mad. But suddenly I was like, hold on a sec. I'm gonna have a baby, you know? I had a baby in December, and that's the big thing that happened in my life. Right. That like made me realize, okay, basketball is important. But my life is more important about basketball. Jason had to have a, a key moment, like the injury in the moment and the birth of his son uh, to get to that point. Uh, but uh, most of the time, basketball spills over to your uh, private life or your private life spills over in the court. Yeah. When, I, uh, when I had my daughter, it was, uh, actually it was 2014, the year that we actually won the EuroLeague. But I remember going home after games because I didn't want to snap at the people that I love. I was, I was locked in a room by myself after a tough loss. There's a point where we need to take care of ourselves, yeah. take care of our families, think of our families first. And the worst thing is most people don't understand that. 2014 was uh, was weird. The team was in great shape. Everybody was doing well. I was playing great, but uh, I had a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble sleeping. A lot of trouble coping with the whole season. And uh, I chose at that time the really bad way to deal with it. Uh, I chose to close everything into myself. Deal with it by myself. I mean, of course, like when I wasn't sleeping in 2004, I could just pop pills until tomorrow and then go to sleep. But uh, we, can, we cannot do that. Uh, actually, that started in Greece and developed more in Israel. The better I play, the more the eyes are on me. It's weird also because when you're in the court, everybody everybody's eyes are on you. But for me, that place was always a uh, safe haven. So I was uh, sweating when I was being, being in the big crowds. Uh, sometimes I was feeling like I didn't want to really keep going, keep competing. Being out with my kids and my family helped a lot. Uh, I still have some issues uh, being out uh, when, when I'm by myself, but uh, I'm, I'm working on it. There is always that one year that is really bad, but eventually in that situation you, you, know, you win a championship and you think like it's all worth it. I mean... Okay, I mean, I'm happy for the championship, but I mean, I could deal with everything else a little bit different if I, if I actually knew what I know now. 
the season that you were talking about, the season that you won EuroLeague, yeah. so your, your peak performance was actually when you were also yeah. struggling. And, and, you know, some of the research is really showing us that at the time at which you're at your peak performance as an athlete is the time at which you're at also, from an age range perspective, at the highest risk of suffering from mental ill health. So there's, there's that sort of big challenge there. And I think what's been really interesting is that everyone has started to mention the things that might help us put some preventative measures in place. The level of communication, I think, helps the inner life of a yeah. team. It helps, helps how the players live the moment. I, I would just add what Maurizio said. Like, it's very important they understand they can talk to you. They need to understand that you're like um, sincerely interested in, in, in their problems. I believe you need to feel very comfortable with those guys. Yeah. You need to trust them and you need to, you need to know they trust you. Another thing is to learn how to handle a big loss. Yeah. You know, 15 years ago while I was in the NBA, like I learned that, hey, don't let this ruin your tomorrow. Right. Like Cole said, don't let uh, this day you ruin your tomorrow. Okay, how you achieve that? Right. And do you think that stops? That will stop players when they are struggling to say, hey, when when you ask them, hey, how you doing? They're going to go, yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm fine. Well, it is so thing, right? hard to open them because they, they, I believe that most of them are growing up in a culture where that showing the weakness, showing, you know, talking about the problem is a projection of weakness. It's difficult for them, it's difficult for everybody to talk. Right. And the worst thing is the people that you can actually talk to them, they will ask you like, okay, why you don't talk to me? It's like, because you won't understand. You don't understand, like, even if I tell you I got this decent problem, you don't understand the restrictions of my, what I can do and not, not do. But maybe the kid at home also needs to hear, yeah. you know what, I had a tough day. Yeah. And I'm a human and I, and I had a tough day. The first time I started talking about my stuff, I was terrified when I asked for three months off work. I, I was really worried that people would think, oh my God, she can't handle it. And I think if we look at global sport internationally now, and the amount of players that are speaking honestly about their mental health and the impact that that is having in society with younger and younger people actually reaching out and saying, hey, I'm struggling. Those are the, those are the messages that over time, and it's not gonna happen immediately, culture change, culture shifts take time. I'm seeing a narrative increase. So I feel like the stigma is starting to shift, but I think more needs to be done. One of my first years in Oklahoma City, we both played for the Thunder, and right away we became close. Um, our wives are friends, and we spent a lot of time together. I would go to his house, and he would come to mine, and I wasn't there when he started going through a lot of his issues uh, with mental health, but I've been through those things as well, and I think that by reaching out and offering that support, I hope I helped, and um, I was able to see him when he came to Munich and it was great to see him and I could see the smile on his face and see how truly happy he was to be home again. And I, I think that's the best thing he could have done for himself is to do what makes him happy. What was your thought process when you did wanted to come back to Spain? That was really bad. Like, I couldn't even watch a basketball game, but, but like, like suddenly, like, one day, I started shooting the ball in the backyard mm -hmm. in my home in Oklahoma and then, like, start watching games. I went to some of the Oklahoma City uh, playoff games and, and I started to, to want to try it again. Right. But I knew like uh, it had to be close to home. Yeah. So feel lonely probably was the, mm -hmm. the, the biggest issue. But yeah, I can say like that was the main thing that caused it. Yeah. It just happened. And right. I didn't know how to manage that. Right. So I tried to talk to professionals, but uh, at the end, like, in that situation, I, I wasn't able to, to get out of it. Right. So I decided to, to stop. Basketball is great and everything, but yeah. it's not worth being yeah. sad. Our whole lives, it's always been all basketball. Like, people yeah. see us as a basketball player, that's all we think about, that's all we do. So you start to, like, think that's all you are, yeah. and you don't have anything else. How I felt about myself was based on how well basketball was yeah. going. 
it happened the same to me. So if it was going bad, I felt really bad about mm -hmm. myself. If it was going well, I felt great. I had yeah. those times too when mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to play basketball anymore because it wasn't, it, I felt like it was destroying happy, me. Yeah. I wasn't happy. The video that you put out, mm -hmm. like what made you want to talk about it? Because it's hard to talk about. Like yeah. a lot of people don't get it. Um, and it's really like a sensitive subject. What made yeah, you want to talk about it? Through the months, uh, we were talking about like how to explain it and we decided to make a video because it could go viral. Yeah. Mental health is really important and, and most of the people have one issue right. during the lifetime. So, I mean, I'm not a professional, I know, but just making the video and make people see that, that even us, that we're like in a good position, like right. with money and we're famous, like whatever you want, we still have this problem because we're human. So yeah. that was the main reason because uh, why I did the video. Así que me he armado de valor para acabar con esta pesadilla. Y lo he conseguido. He recuperado la sonrisa, las ganas de verte y de volver a pasar una y mil horas juntos. Querido balón, he vuelto. And we've talked about some of the challenges, but let's let's talk about how we take care of our mental health a little bit. So, I, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what I do, um, just for full disclosure. You know, I, I've been in therapy for a long time. I still see my therapist, my psychiatrist, a dietitian. I also see a therapist. That'd be working with her like for a year and a half, I feel so good. But I want to keep working with her. Right. And we got to realize that sometimes we're not going to be good. We can have a bad day or two or three, you know? That's not a problem. It's our job as a player to speak up. Communication, I think, is one of the, the main key to, to keep that, that balance and keep that mental health really, really, I mean, balanced in a good way. You know, you said to us earlier, you feel great right now. You feel like you're in really good mental condition, but you still see your therapist and it's exactly the same with our physical health, right? Coach. You need to try to surround yourself with the people you, you trust and you like, you love. But the thing is, for example, I'm, I'm one of those uh, um, guys who will protect them from my problems. If they're, they're, they like me, they love me, uh, and they care about me deeply, and I know that, I don't want them, I don't want to disrupt their mental health with my problems. Do you understand yes. that? we really can start looking at mental resilience and toughness as being strong enough to ask for help when you're struggling, as well as cultivating some of those coping mechanisms so that when you're struggling, you can still perform. Not always, yeah. but sometimes. sometimes. Maurizio, tell us a little bit about how you look after your mental health. I'm counting on a, on a very close inner circle, families in the first place, but I'm trying not to bring home the, let's say, potential issues or stress of my life. And then I also try the best possible way two things. First, not to get, if I can, ever overexcited or over depressed. And then in my daily life, I try to put in things that somehow help me relaxing. Music that relax you, end of the day always ends with a nice book. Mm -hmm. uh, during the day, if I can, stay away at least one hour from the phones. Yep. You know, little things like this right. that are like pressure relievers, yeah. you know. I believe in balance. I believe in uh, not in controlling the emotion, but uh, leaving the emotion with the right approach. And uh, it's not that I'm not enjoying uh, victories. Uh, and it's not that I'm not uh, concerned when things don't go right. Uh, I'm always focused 24-7 on, on, on my profession, on the results of my job. But, but again, I, I think that uh, uh, being a GM of a club and somehow you are in a leadership role and, and you lead with your balance, with your body language, with your words, and, uh, and your approach has to reflect all this as you try to pass a message to your organization. Coach, when you're looking to bring new players and you're obviously looking at the physical rating that they get, but how about mental ratings? Is there data available to you? Can you, you know, bring, bring that into play? Is that something you think would be useful? X and O's, that's just one part, you know, what they can do on the floor, what kind of skills they have, whatever. But, you know, the other things that 
some of them we are discussing today, uh, are also important. You know, how they handle stress, how quickly they can respond, are they ready to work, are they ready to help, are, are they ready to open themselves to help them, all those things. If you can, if you, can uh, you know, collect all those information, it's, right. it's helpful. We were in Toronto in 2006. We got the, basically we were one of the first team, we got a, a sports psychologist. The psycho-evaluation that they do there is, a, you know, very deep, Standard yeah, evaluation that they yeah. do. You know, at the end of the day, they collect like a, yeah. a folder on each player, which becomes something that follows the player for all the all his career. Even I, I believe they the, we need there there will be there need to be some drastic changes. Yeah, will they be? No. I am a I'm an optimist at heart, and I I truly believe that. This topic is talked about more now than it ever has been. I think we can talk about mental health as specific to humanity yeah. and a key part of it. And I think that's really why we don't have to wait for a tragedy because this is about everyone. We can help everybody. Even sure. saying, I'm like speaking up, yeah. you know? It's not an issue that we have problems. We are athletes, we're not perfect, right. you know? Like you said before, we are human beings, yeah. you know? And everybody got problems. When I realized that all of the other things in my life were starting to fall apart because I wasn't able to deal with what I was struggling with at the time, which was an eating disorder. And in that moment when I realised, oh my God, I need help and I'm going to ask for it, something shifted. That, that, that real vulnerability that brings us together as humans and says, I need a hand, let me help you. Um, thank you all so much for being so honest today. For me, I think it's such a crucial step in normalizing what has been a conversation that's been taboo for a long time. The fact that you're human and, and life has happened and some of it's been harder than others. And like everyone else, your mental health exists on the same scale as your physical one and we move up and down it. And I, I'm just really grateful um, for, for your authenticity and your honesty today. Mm -hmm.